Hi everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, More Than Sand and Swimming, Georgia's Beaches as Wildlife Habitat. Abby Sterling, Manomet Shorebird Biologist for the Georgia Bight Shorebird Conservation Initiative, will give you an in-depth look at the role beaches play as shorebird habitat. We are also very excited to have Katherine Ridley, Project Coordinator for the St. Simons Island Sea Turtle Project and Vice President of Education and Communications for 100 Miles, joining us today to talk about the importance of our beaches for nesting sea turtles. If you're new to Manomet, we are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit. Since Manomet's beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts-based bird banding operation. With shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries and more, Manomet has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future for us and the birds. Today's webinar is made possible through the support of our generous sponsors to our end of summer campaign. I'd like to take a, think, I'd like to take a moment to thank and recognize Howland Capital, Hemingway and Barnes, Eagle Muir Foundation, Rockland Trust, Rogers Gray, Boston Trust Walden Company, Prime Buckles, and Alpha Pension Group. For more information about our end of summer campaign and our sponsors, visit manomet.org summer 2020. Just a couple of quick things before we begin. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it will be recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Abby and Catherine to talk about how we can do a better job sharing our beaches with shorebirds, sea turtles, and other wildlife. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. We're going to be talking about some of the most charismatic wildlife that depend on the beach habitats in coastal Georgia uh, and highlight how much more there is to the beach than just sand and swimming. And of course, we can't talk about beach habitat without thinking about sea turtles, so we're so grateful that Katherine Ridley is joining us today. Um, she has over 20 years of experience on the coast building connections and raising awareness. So thanks so much for joining us, Catherine. I'm Abby Sterling. Uh, I work on the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative, uh, or MANAMET. So I focus on bringing together partners between Northeast Florida, South Carolina, uh, and the Georgia coast. One focus uh, with partners at National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, National Audubon, and Virginia Tech is to better understand how birds and people are using our public beaches. Uh, the main take, home, uh, take homes of today's talk are going to be to highlight some of the unique and important features of our coastline, and then talk about some of the species that rely on our beaches. Um, we're also going to talk about the impact of recreational disturbance and what uh, things we can do to help so that wildlife and people thrive on our coast. I work on the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative, and uh, our, our goals broadly are to unite partners and bring together recognition for the important part of this world. Um, the Southeast has an incredible legacy of conservation with many partners that are actively managing and protecting habitat for wildlife and shorebirds. And in recognition of this valuable habitat, there are actually three Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network sites in the Georgia Bight. You can see those on the map here. Um, the Georgia Bight stretches broadly from Cape Hatteras down to Cape Canaveral, uh, but the focus of our work here at Manomet is really from Northeast Florida all the way up through South Carolina. And so the three wizard sites that you can see are Cape Romaine, Santee Delta region up in South Carolina, the Altamaha River Delta Wizard site right in the middle of Georgia, 
And then broadly, the Georgia Barrier Islands were just designated as a landscape of hemispheric importance. Um, and so this really helps to highlight just how important, important this region of the world is uh, for shorebirds. But um, we want to take a bit of a step back and think about really why that is. What is it that makes the Georgia coast so critical for wildlife and shorebirds? Um, and so we can look at this image, which I love, and if you've heard me talk before, you've probably seen it, um, but it highlights how the Georgia coast really has all of the perfect features that make it really incredible habitat. So you can see the Georgia coast outlined there in yellow, um, and you notice right away it's kind of at the very crux of the bend of the Georgia Bight, and it's pretty far away from the edge of the continental shelf, which means we have pretty low wave energy, so low tidal amplitude. We also have, I'm sorry, low, low tidal, low wave height, um, which means very low wave energy. But we have a really high tidal range, six to nine feet um, in, in tidal range. And you can see that dotted line kind of peaks right at Georgia. So we have really, really big tides. We have um, really low wave energy. And that means we have a lot of great sandbars and islands that build up. We also have a lot of inlets, areas where water is flowing out through the state down to the coastline here. So we have a lot of inlets. And then those inlets are really close together. And so what that means is we've got tons of nutrients pouring down through the interior part of the state right out here on the coast, creating really important food resources for shorebirds and a lot of other wildlife as well. And this results in a very dynamic, ever-changing landscape. And so some of you may be familiar with uh, this image here, um, and that's sort of uh, what it looks like. That, that photo is actually from 2019, so um, about, well, January 2019. But we can look at it back in time and we can really get a sense of how much this landscape changes over time, 2013, 2008, 2005, all the way back to 1988. And, um, and if you're familiar with this place, you know, just from going out there, that it's changed uh, tremendously. And so because all of these sands are allowed to move around and shift around, all these nutrients are constantly moving and, and shifting, this really dynamic place is great for invertebrates, which feeds um, kind of the base of the food chain that results in very rich habitat for a lot of different wildlife species, including shorebirds. And so broadly, um, when we think about this area, we have a lot of great benefits here on the Georgia coast. Um, we, we live in a place that has these extensive remote beaches, um, really uh, beautiful places um, with this high tidal range, these vast expansive sand and mud flats that host all the different invertebrates uh, that shorebirds feed on. Um, a lot of the coast is actually pretty natural and relatively undeveloped. Many of the shorelines are not hardened, so sand can continue to move and build habitat. And while there are many remote areas, there are also some really wonderful, easy to access beaches on the Georgia coast. Because of our great climate, there are year-round recreational opportunities, and tourism is a critical and an important driver to many of the coastal communities. Um, so just because there might be people on this call, thanks to the beauty of Zoom, and you can join from literally any place uh, in the world, uh, I wanted to back up a little bit and, and take a moment to just introduce you to the Georgia coast. Um, so when we think about the Georgia coast linearly, it's about 100 miles, and I've kind of broken it down with some images, um, thanks to, to friends at Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Um, so you can kind of see this beautiful chain of barrier islands, the edges, the Georgia coast and then the expansive salt marshes that are just behind those islands between the mainland and the islands. And so at the northern part of the coast up near Savannah, we have places like Fort Pulaski and then Little Tybee Island. Uh, we have Tybee Island, a little farther south is another barrier island, Wausau Island. Um, and then we can move a little farther uh, down the coast to the middle section. And that includes barrier islands that are well protected, including Ossipa Island, St. Catharines Island, Sapelo Island, and Blackbeard. Farther south of that, uh, we see um, the Ultimaha River Delta, 
a really ecologically significant gem on the East Coast. Uh, with Little St. Simons Island right there at the south end of the Altamaha River, St. Simons Island where Gould's Inlet is, which we'll be talking about extensively, Sea Island and Chapel Island, which we'll also be talking about. And then finally, all the way south, down to the border of Florida, we have um, Little Cumberland Island, which is privately owned, and then the National Seashore of Cumberland Island, which is managed by the National Park Service. So to make this a little bit more fun and exciting for everybody that is um, joining us remotely, we thought we would uh, throw in a few fun participation polls. Um, so we have our first audience poll question, and that is, um, which beaches do you visit if you uh, are visiting the Georgia coast? And so you can choose as many as you'd like here. You don't have to just choose one. Um, and you don't have to feel bad if you don't visit the beaches, there's an option there for you as well. We'll let this go for a little bit. I can't actually see when people have done this poll, so hopefully there are all sorts of great um, responses coming in. <laughs> Uh, it looks, Abby, like uh, Jekyll Island and St. Simon's Island are tops uh, oh. on the polling. That's great. Yeah, those are some real, real lovely places to get to visit. Awesome. That's fun. Oh, cool. That's great. Jekyll Island is a hot spot. And there's about 28% of you that don't live near the Georgia coast. So um, you can put that on your bucket list, hopefully, uh, when things resume normalcy and we're able to travel a little bit better. Cool. Um, so one thing I think that's really neat to think about when you're thinking about the beach, and it's a, it's a very important feature of the beach, is of course it's not uniformed on the entire stretch of beach. So if you've been to Jekyll, maybe you've ridden a bike on the beach, it's a huge long stretch of beach, and you know that it's, it's not the same every place that you go, right? Not every section of beach looks the same. And so you might go to one spot on the beach for beach combing, and you might go to another spot for sitting, and you might go to another spot for swimming. And so you can have a tremendous amount of variation across even just one Barrier Islands Beach. Um, the beach is a, a really incredible habitat, and it changes. It's a very diverse place. And so wildlife view it very similarly, right? It's not one thing in every single section. Um, and so because it is habitat, it provides critical resources for species that have adapted to use it. And, and the beach is really incredible. You can think about it. It's just such a narrow band of, of, uh, of land really between the upland and the ocean. And so it provides a lot of different opportunities for different species. And we can see that when we think about how shorebirds use the beach, right? Some places might be avoided by birds completely because they just don't have the right conditions. Um, well, other places, there might be huge congregations of shorebirds, either feeding like you see on the left there, or roosting where they're resting on the beach. Some places might not look uh, all that great to a shorebird and they may pose some other challenges, like when there are a lot of vehicles or people or dogs on the beach. And so that is what we're going to be talking about today. But first, another fun polling question. And this one is, why do you visit Georgia's public beaches? And again, sorry for you folks that don't um, live near Georgia beaches. Um, I suppose you could Play along though and imagine what you would do if you um, if you came to the beach in Georgia as well. <laughs> we have about 50% of votes in and it looks like most of the winner right now is to see birds. I'm not surprised. I know. I feel like we've kind of skewed this poll a little bit. It's um, hopefully it's a pretty a pretty birdy crowd. Catherine, we should have put the sea sea turtles on here. That would have gotten a, a good response as well. <laughs> Excellent. 
I'm going to give you one or two more seconds to vote and then I'm going to end the polling. Good. We have a lot of people that need to come visit the Georgia beaches. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, now we're going we're gonna to think a little bit more beyond just people using the beaches and we're going to be talking about how the wildlife that we all love use Georgia's beaches. Um, and that's thinking specifically about sea turtles and shorebirds. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine um, to, to get us acquainted with some of the sea turtles that use the Georgia coast. Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to come and um, talk turtles. <laughs> Uh, my name is Katherine Ridley, as Abby uh, mentioned. I'm the Vice President of Education and Communications for a nonprofit here for Georgia's coast called 100 Miles. We're, of course, um, about a 100-mile coastline, so our name is a little bit of a teaching opportunity. Um, but I'm also very fortunate to get to manage our nesting program, uh, nest monitoring program on St. Simons Island. So I'm the project coordinator for the St. Simons Island Sea Turtle Project. We're an all-volunteer team um, that monitors St. Simons beaches for nests and strandings um, and other um, and conducts education for, for sea turtles. Um, we're part of the larger Georgia Sea Turtle Cooperative, which is a network of different projects spanning the coast. Um, we, there's actually a very long legacy of um, sea turtle conservation on Georgia's coast. As you may know, the oldest loggerhead nesting project in the entire world um, was started on Little Cumberland Island by Dr. Jim Richardson in the um, early 60s. So that's certainly a point of pride. Um, we've actually, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we've actually been doing comprehensive nesting surveys though on all of our beaches um, from Tybee all the way, Little Tybee all the way down to Cumberland Island since 1989. So um, while y'all are, are hopefully sleeping maybe or, or getting up in the morning, um, there's generally someone covering every single stretch of beach um, on Georgia's coast looking for sea turtles. And of course, one of the things that's so fun is that we get to interact with a lot of our bird friends um, at, at, at the same time. And I'm sure, um, just as you do, we field a lot of questions about birds. I know a lot of our, our colleagues say, well, they're out looking for birds and they're fielding questions about sea turtles, but it's great that we're kind of all in it together. Um, and I'm glad to be here today. Um, I just want to introduce you to our most common nesting species. That's the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, loggerheads got their name for having this big hulking head that they use. They have very strong jaw muscles that they use to eat things like whelks and sometimes horseshoe crabs and other, um, other hard-shelled things. Um, they can weigh about 250 pounds on average. Um, I like this picture in particular because you can see it looks a little bit like she has these gluey crying tears as she's leaving the beach and leaving her nest behind. Um, a lot of people wonder if they're sad to leave their, their eggs behind, but not really. Um, they're kind of out of there, I think, but um, on to the next thing. But those are actually glands that they use to secrete excess salt. Um, so it's kind of fun, um, kind of fun to see that. We do have some other species that occasionally nest here in Georgia. Um, the green sea turtle, leatherbacks, Kim's Ridley's, um, but uh, this year we have eight green sea turtle nests um, across our coast to date, but it's primarily loggerheads. Um, now, like other reptiles, um, loggerhead sea turtles and sea turtles in general are tied to land for reproduction. So this is where we know the most about turtles. That's where we really get to, our sea turtles, where we really get to do a lot of research and understand their behavior. Um, nesting season begins in May and runs through September, early October, um, into October, sometimes at the tail end of the season. This year we had our first nest, um, Georgia's Coast did, on April 26th on Cumberland Island. It's always Cumberland. Cumberland gets all the, the accolades usually, but um, our last nest, or our most recent nest, was laid um, on August 25th on Wausau, Wausau Island by a turtle that clearly did not get the memo. Um, <laughs> she's extending the season for them quite a bit. Um, but they, you know, females do tend to, they, they actually mate in the spring, 
sort of a big spring break off our coast and then um, they store the sperm and are able to um, fertilize their nests and, and nest about four to six times per season. So they're coming up just under every two weeks or so um, along our chain of beaches. They generally come up at night. This is a, a daytime nester that you see on the screen and they're using the primary dunes um, to really you know, create a body pit, throw a lot of sand, use their back flippers to carve out an egg chamber and deposit eggs. So it's about an average of 125, or excuse me, about 120, sometimes 115 eggs um, in each clutch. Um, that same daytime nester, I have a little video I thought we would try. Um, you can see her leaving the beach. It might be a little choppy here. Um, Zoom and videos don't always mix, but um, it's just fun to see them in action. Um, full disclosure, this is actually from 2003, so this is a not a not a this season turtle. But the nesting process is pretty arduous. It can take you know an hour or more, um, and this is where we really are going to document a lot of those human interactions. Again, usually it's at night. This is one that was sort of a dawn turtle leaving the beach as we get on there. Um, but if you know if you ever encounter a nesting turtle. Um, turtles go into when they actually start dro dropping their eggs they go into what you know it looks like it's really a trance um, and that's where they're less likely to be disturbed but if you encounter them as she is just going up or she's just starting to build her nest um, she's probably going to turn around um, for fear of, of that interaction um, and do what we call a false crawl or a nest uh, non-nesting emergence and so we really want to encourage people if you're ever lucky enough to see a nesting female or any sea turtle on the beach um, you really want to stay very far back and watch from a, a safe and quiet distance and not interrupt that process. Um, so most of the time, I'm sorry that video didn't quite, quite work as well as I had hoped, but <laughs> um, most of the time, this is sort of the scene that we see in the morning. Most of our nesting projects along the coast are dawn patrols. We do have a couple that conduct um, night survey and some tagging projects, um, but most are, are dawn patrols. So we go out and we look for these telltale um, look like to me like tractor trailers tracks have just come out of the ocean and made a big mess, um, left this body pit behind. Um, we use a probe. You can see me probing in that lower right picture. It's sort of a wooden dowel and you feel for a very soft spot in the sand and that's a little bit of an air pocket where she is, she's left those eggs. Um, and then we take one nest, we actually sacrifice, take one egg, excuse me, from each nest, sacrifice that egg, and we send it to the geneticists at the University of Georgia. There's a really fascinating um, research project that has been going on for more than well over a decade now, um, where they've put together a database of nesting sea turtles, so um, loggerhead sea turtles. So sort of like ancestry.com for loggerheads, where they can track the different genetic relationships between all of the turtles that lay their eggs on our coast. Um, but for the most time part, we try to manipulate those um, nests as little as possible. We think that mama knows best in this case. Um, and they have a nesting strategy really to hedge their bets. They're going to nest some high in the dunes, um, high up in the primary dunes, and some lower at the base of the dunes. Um, because just like us, they can't really predict what the season might look like, whether it's going to be a hot, dry summer, whether we're going to have significant storm events that would cool it, cool it down, and you know, which would be the safer location. And so they do nest all over, and we try to limit our relocations um, as much as we can, although we do sometimes relocate our nests when they're laid generally below that spring high tide line where they would be inundated too frequently to survive. Um, so the dunes are their nursery ground. Um, you can see that sort of sloped egg chamber there. They're going to incubate for an average of about 60 days. Um, St. Simons did get one um, of the first in the state this year. We had our first hatch, um, the first hatch in the entire state of Georgia, and that was on July 9th. Um, our nest this year actually hatched a little bit on the early side in 51, 52, 53 days, um, but most of them this year went a little bit longer because if you do live here on the coast, even though it's been really hot, Recently, the early part of the season was a cooler uh, sum, uh, part, start to the summer, and so these nests have been taking a little longer to develop. Um, but again, just like with, with uh, nesting, they're going to hatch at night, um, and when they all start to scramble out to the sea, you may have seen a picture, or you may have been lucky enough to see it in person, we call it a boil. It looks a little bit like a pot of water boiling over, um, but with um, 
but with turtles. And they instinctively are going to crawl towards the brightest part of the horizon, um, which um, is really a lot of times people think they go just to the moon, but they're actually going towards the reflection of the sky and the horizon on the water. Um, so on a natural beach, we really want that to be, um, or on, on any beach, we really want that just to be the, the ocean, but we'll talk a little bit about sometimes what gets in the way. Um, you can see actually in this picture some look like mountain bike tracks. Those are hatchling tracks and this is really in the direction we want to see them. Our team goes out every morning and again all the nesting projects go out and we count the tracks and we look to see where they've headed and to see if there's any misorientations or any turtles that have been going in the wrong direction and led astray often door, uh, due to some light pollution issues. Um, we wait um, about five days um, after the ex uh, after we first see tracks, and you can see a little hatchling making um, his or her way. <laughs> Again, a little choppy here, but um, then we go in and we do a nest inventory to see if there's any trapped hatchlings, and also to count eggshells to see how the nest fared um, in terms of nesting success and hatchling success. Um, and one thing I'll just mention really quickly is that the hatchling the hatchlings really pick up their cues from their nesting beach um, in order to be able to return on about 35 years later. I was thinking about that today because I, I got lost in a parking lot <laughs> after a doctor's appointment today and I was thinking, gosh, you know, I can't do this an hour later and sea turtles are able to, you know, somehow 35 years later find their way back to the beach. Um, quick, quick update though on Georgia's nesting season. We've had um, an above average year, so just under 2,800 nests. Um, not quite as exciting as the last couple of years where we've set some records. Last year was a record year um, in the entire state at just under 4,000 nests, but it's still, you know, more than twice the levels that we, um, as a collaborative, documented when we started doing those comprehensive surveys back in 89. So it's definitely moving in the right direction. Our population of loggerhead sea turtles um, is on average increasing at a rate of about 3% per year over the last 30 years. So that's really heartening news. You can, you can see the graph here. Um, there was a dip in 2004. I was on the beach in Jekyll then and we had less than 400 nests in the state. Um, and really at that time there was some concern that this population was actually going to become extinct in our lifetimes. So it's really exciting to see the, the, the buoy and the increasing numbers. Um, of course, nesting numbers and density do vary um, by island. Again, Cumberland is kind of the powerhouse on the coast, and you'll see the, the different um, totals to date. Um, bringing up the rear is St. Simons, <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case, St. Simons and Little Tybee, but um, you can see some, um, see that hatchling making your way down. So the, the thing about it though, when we think, look at those numbers, there's a lots of reasons um, why turtles choose to nest or not nest um, on any particular beach. For example, on St. Simons, we have a very large sandbar um, that blocks um, a good deal of the nesting beach and, and deters females in many, in many cases, but development and act, human activity certainly play a role. And so nesting densities on those development beaches in Georgia are lower than the nesting on undeveloped beaches. Um, and on the beach, you know, humans cause a number of issues. We'll just flip through a couple of the uh, pictures why. Um, obviously, rock, um, what raw structures, groins, loss of, loss of the dunes um, causes the turtles to, you can actually see in that first picture, she just sort of did a U-turn and turned back to the ocean. But, you know, then we cause obstacles. We, we leave these giant sand castles and holes on the beach. Um, we take our dogs on the beach. Um, full disclosure, that's my dog, but you'll see she's on a leash. Um, and then sometimes abandoned gear, you know, leaving things behind. It's against a number of ordinances, but people do it anyway. And so all those man-made structures cause unnecessary obstacles. But by far, the biggest um, conservation concern um, on, on the beach, um, oh, you can go ahead. Um, on the beach um, is artificial lighting. Um, obviously, um, on our developed beaches, you know, on St. Simons and Jekyll and Sea Island and Tybee Island, this is something that we contend with. These are some pictures of St. Simons. Um, for me, I always struggle with this because it can be really hard for the public to, um, to get the public to get behind this issue. 
um, you, you know, with, when you see a big hole, it's something very tangible. But, you know, with um, lighting, it can be really hard to maybe understand um, or to, to picture. Um, but this picture shows you um, a nest from two years ago. And again, when those hatchlings leave the nest, they're going towards that brightest part on the horizon. And in this case, we had a number of houses that were quite lit up. And we lost basically that entire nest um, from turtles that were misoriented and went towards, um, you know, the row of homes. Glen County, um, where I live and where we run our project, um, has a beach lighting ordinance that um, um, is in place, but it was written in the 80s and it was last updated in the 90s. Um, and unfortunately, um, it's really time to, to strengthen that and, and certainly some others on the, the coast. Jekyll has a pretty good ordinance um, in place. They just went through a revision process with that one, but it's time now to focus on the Glen County ordinance and maybe on the one um, ones uh, on other parts of the coast as well. But really, I, you know, we often call it light pollution, but um, it's really a form of habitat loss because it renders otherwise suitable habitat um, unusable for nest, both nesting females and their hatchlings. So I just want to talk quickly, um, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm talking too much about turtles, but um, what you can do. Um, the biggest thing, again, I want to focus on right now is lighting. Um, if you're staying on the beach, um, again, put it on your bucket list, come and stay with us. But um, if you're staying by the ocean or you have a home on the ocean, please shade your lights, you know, turn off your outdoor lighting, make sure those, even those interior light, lights aren't shading onto the beach. Um, you can use turtle friendly lighting. Um, sea turtles have been shown um, to be less disturbed by long wavelength light, which is over 560 nanometers, um, the amber or red light. So you can choose to use one of those, whether it's a flashlight um, or, or lighting on your home. Um, I always encourage people to walk by the light of the moon too. One thing I just want to flag for you is that Glynn County is in the process of um, taking public comments on and working towards a new zoning ordinance. And under that will be um, an opportunity for us to strengthen our beach lighting ordinance. Um, so you can contact me for more information about that, but they'll um, be accepting public comment from the 10th through the 20th. And we really want to show that people care um, and, and want to see turtle safe um, lighting in place. Um, and then of course, some other simple steps that you can see there as well. Um, and then you'll see on the next slide, um, there's, again, these are some signs you might have seen if you've been to Gould's Inlet or some of the other beach access points on St. Simons. Um, just some simple tips that you can take to protect sea turtles and shorebirds. Um, gratuitously, I want to end with a picture of my son um, who helped me release this, this hatchling the other day um, and a quote that I always think about. I won't read the whole thing to you, but I'll just tell you it's um, Henry David Thoreau wrote in his journal about a sea turtle laying eggs or a turtle laying eggs. Um, and it was actually 164 years ago. And it always makes me think that, you know, it makes me consider our place in the order of things and the time of things, um, the legacy that's been on our coast and, and maybe the legacy that we want to leave for, for our children as well. Because when that turtle that you see on the screen comes back, hopefully in another 35 years, um, you know, what is our beach going to look like and what do, what um, what will my son and, and our children be able to experience? So um, that's why I do this work, and that's why I encourage all of us who care about birds and turtles and wildlife to to um, get involved as well. So. Thank you. Um, that was a quick overview, and I'll turn it back over to Abby. That is great, Catherine, and thank you so much. I really feel uh, strongly that you know sea turtles are so well loved by everyone on the coast. Um, and rightfully so. I think you highlighted that so perfectly. And so we're hoping to spread some of that love to shorebirds as well. And, um, and I think one of the great things about the Georgia coast is that we can actually appreciate shorebirds throughout the entire year. Um, we have shorebirds using the coast during migration, which is fall and spring. Uh, we have birds like piping plovers, some very famous piping plovers are recently visiting us right now from Chicago, which is cool. And they'll spend the winter with us. And then the nesting season is also really important. And so we have over 300,000 shorebirds that use our coasts throughout the entire year um, with some very significant percentages of, of some very rare species. Um, so 30% of the roof of red knots, 30% of the Great Lakes breeding piping plovers. And we actually have one of the largest staging 
uh, areas of Wimbro in the spring. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about that and highlight how some of these public access beaches um, are, are very important for, uh, for shorebirds. We have several species of shorebirds that nest on the Georgia coast, so they are well acquainted with our nesting sea turtles. Two are of particular importance, and that's the American oyster catcher on the left and the Wilson's plover on the right, They're considered threatened and rare in the state of Georgia. They nest on the ground in open depressions, blending in perfectly uh, with their surroundings. So those nests are really vulnerable because unlike a sea turtle that buries its eggs, these are right out on the surface of the sand. After about 25 or 28 days, they, the eggs will hatch and they have these adorable, fuzzy, precocial chicks, which you can see in the right. There's some little Wilson's clover chicks. And those little chicks are up and running. They leave that nest site within a few hours of hatching, uh, moving around on the beach with their parents looking for good feeding and hiding areas. So they often nest at the rack line or on flats or in dunes, and then they feed at the ocean or at inlets or kind of in the flats behind the beaches. And here you can see um, a, an incubating adult, very attentive. And so these birds are keeping the eggs safe from predators, but also from overheating in the sun. And so actually only a few minutes in the hot Georgia sun in the middle of the summer and the eggs or if there's chicks, they may overheat and die. And so this is one reason that it is so important not to disturb nesting birds and why we try to give them plenty of space. So uh, if birds are flushed because of people or dogs, you know, those eggs could overheat or predators could have the opportunity to get, uh, to get the eggs or chicks as well. So, um, so the both male and female Wilson's plovers and oyster catchers actually protect, uh, protect the eggs and chicks. So it's a really uh, neat thing to get to observe safely from a distance is, is these birds, you know, catching their eggs and raising their chicks. And one of the best public beaches to see nesting shorebirds um, is Gould's Inlet on St. Simons Island. Um, Gould's Inlet is right up at the north end of St. Simons um, and really is such a great example of a wildlife beach. There's nesting Wilson's plovers and nesting seabirds called least terns, the smallest tern um, that, that we have. And here you can see uh, in this picture, um, Georgia Department of Natural Resources sets up an exclosure and then that's maintained all throughout the summer by a very large uh, network of very rugged and awesome volunteers. So um, a shout out to those folks who might be on this call. We had a really successful year of nesting birds at Gould's Inlet this year. We had about eight pairs of Wilson's plovers in a pretty small area and we saw about 12 fledged chicks. That lower picture there is a a chick you can see it's got a little bit of a fuzzy tail and we had probably about 50 pairs of least turns and, and counted over a hundred um, fledged, fledged chicks and so that's the snappy looking guy there on the right um, with the little fuzzy chick. So um, one of the other really incredible things of beyond nesting that shorebirds do is migration. So book ending either side of nesting um, we have migration happening. Spring migration is from March to May and that is when we have huge numbers of shorebirds traveling uh, to go from the south to the north where many of them are nesting up in the Arctic. And then fall migration is when those same birds head south to winter um, either here in the southeast or farther south in South America. Um, so you can see the tracks of all these birds in this huge globe, um, just giving you a rough idea of sort of what that might look like. And then you can see the, the Atlantic coast there is part of the Atlantic flyway. And so this is a major path that many of these birds will travel on is, is up and down these different flyways across the whole entire hemisphere. And so this time of year we're in fall migration and we should start to see some really big impressive flocks of shorebirds moving through. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this, the story of probably one of the most well-recognized long-distance migrants, and that is the red knot. We see um, red knots on the Georgia coast every year that travel really tremendous distances, some traveling nearly 20,000 miles um, as they move from one end of the earth to the other. Now, this bird is about the size of a robin, and it takes this journey in a series of sort of breathtaking flights. Moving north from Tierra del Fuego in the very southern part of South America there and then to Brazil and then up to the Georgia coast and then finally 
all the way up to the Arctic tundra to nest. And so each hop will take several days flying thousands of miles. Um, and these birds are flying the whole entire time, flapping their wings the whole time. They're not soaring like a vulture, they are flapping, um, really just burning fuel that they've stored as, uh, as they stop at east, each of these um, stopover places. And so it's really important for migrating shorebirds to have a safe place to stop. They depend on key sites with good food and good places to rest. And so in the spring migration, when they're moving south to north, one of the most important food resources for birds along the Atlantic coast is horseshoe crab eggs. And you can see in the picture there, um, they look like little green BBs. And so you get huge um, spawning congregations of horseshoe crabs. They come up on the beach during the highest high tides and they lay eggs right at the tide line. And that's a readily available food resource that the birds can eat and store as, um, as easily accessible nutrition that will fuel um, those journeys of thousands of miles. Um, perhaps um, one of the, the neatest things about these birds is while they do depend on these sites, they also have what's called site fidelity. And so that means just like when we're on a really long um, road trip and we have our favorite places that we always stop every single time, these birds do the same exact thing and they have fidelity to these certain sites where they know they can get good food and, and good places to rest. And we know that because of birds like um, B95. And so many of these shorebirds are banded with um, field readable tags that allow us to identify individuals. And so B95 uh, was banded and then recited at every single stop of that migration for uh, almost, almost 20 years. And during that time frame, it logged enough miles to travel the distance to the moon and nearly back again. Um, so this is pretty, um, pretty incredible and really highlighted just what these birds go through on these tremendous journeys. Now red knots and many other shorebirds are experiencing population declines. This population of red knots that we have on the east coast is actually federally listed as threatened because of those population declines. Um, but uh, we here on the Georgia coast um, host uh, some really important resources uh, for, for birds like that red knot. Um, so at Fort Pulaski, uh, sand was used and, and built up uh, on the shoreline to help actually protect some of the fort from erosion in 2015. And it created a shoreline that shorebirds actually love. So we see hundreds of shorebirds roosting at Fort Pulaski during high tide. We've seen Wilson's plovers nesting at Fort Pulaski. You can see there's a pretty poor picture, but that is the chick from this year. It had two other siblings that all successfully fledged. And then really exciting, um, it was a very important location for migrants getting ready to travel um, north this spring. We had a, a big horseshoe crab spawning event and a lot of shorebirds, including sanderlings, semi-palmated sandpipers, red knots, and ruddy turnstones. And we know that these birds are traveling huge distances and these long distance birds are indeed using Fort Pulaski. So this is super cool. Um, and, and really exciting. Two um, champions of migration that, that we got to see right at Fort Pulaski. And that includes this black-bellied plover, 25A, here on the left. Um, and that was actually recited in fall of 2019 by Diana Churchill. If anybody's a birder up in the Savannah area, um, you undoubtedly know Diana. Um, she recited that bird. And then in the spring, um, I was out and actually saw the same bird. And so we contacted biologists who told us that this bird was banded way up here at this red star um, in, in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic. And so you can see a picture there. Um, Paul Woodard is the one that, that banded that bird. That's his, presumably his hand. At the very least, it's his photo. And, um, and he's with uh, Environment Canada, and he confirmed that indeed this was a bird that he banded. And so we saw it in the spring and in the fall. It might spend the whole winter with us or it might migrate farther south and then we just happened to catch it on both the fall and the spring migration. Not really sure yet, but we're gonna be on the lookout for this guy throughout the winter so we can see if we can confirm that. Another very exciting bird that we saw this spring at Fort Pulaski feeding on those horseshoe crabs was a red banded red knot. And this was super cool. This bird was probably one of the last red knots. A lot of the knots had already left and headed north. And there was one bird hanging out in this mixed block of all these shorebirds. You can just barely make out a little orange flag on that bird. Um, and that bird was actually banded down in San Antonio Oeste, 
by Patricia Gonzalez, and she banded that bird in 2017. Um, and, and we got to see it there on Fort Pulaski. So really uh, pretty incredible and just highlights how important some of these public beaches are for shorebirds. We also see shorebirds using places like Jekyll Island. It's really critical habitat and it's uh, for both nesting Wilson's plovers, for roosting birds, for sea turtles, and it's actually been designated um, as critical habitat for piping plovers. So in keeping with Jack Lyland's mission uh, as to act as stewards for wildlife, um, they have designated the South End um, as critical habitat. And that means there's no dogs allowed down there because it is so important for wildlife, which is really a, a pretty incredible step to protect that place for shorebirds. And last but not least, um, another important public beach uh, that shorebirds rely on is actually Tybee Island as well. It's important for roosting birds and it's important for um, uh, for wintering piping plovers as well. And so we actually get to see some piping plovers hanging out there. And, and in the past, there's been huge numbers of uh, oyster catchers that'll roost up on Tybee Island's beaches. Um, and in the past, we've actually seen some seabirds like black skimmers trying to utilize that beach to nest as well. And so while it may seem like the Georgia coast is idyllic, there are actually some pretty significant issues that are impacting wildlife. Um, so we're seeing very significant population declines of shorebirds broadly, which is shown in that gray line. Um, and some of the issues that they face here include things like habitat loss, um, impacts from climate change, low reproductive success, but also issues uh, due to recreational disturbance. And so that is of course what we are mostly talking about today. And so um, what is recreational disturbance? Recreational disturbance is a challenging threat because it's often the result of lack of knowledge or awareness. And it's, it's basically when due to the presence of people in critical habitat, whether it's driving or people being out on the mm. beaches or dogs uh, chasing flocks of shorebirds, um, there's pressure that means even if the habitat is perfect for nesting or feeding or roosting birds, these places can basically become functionally unavailable. The birds are not going to use them. And so it can impact birds in a variety of different ways. It can impact birds during nesting. So um, we talked about how eggs and chicks are really cryptic um, and they can be difficult to see and therefore avoid. Adults can be flushed, leaving vulnerable chicks. Um, or they can face direct mortality um, from, from um, vehicles or from dogs. Um, just as a disclaimer, this little plover is actually just hiding in the depression of the footprint, but it does give you a good indication for the scale that these little fuzzballs are when they're running around out on the beaches. And so um, outside of the nesting season during winter or migration, disturbance means less time to feed, um, which can reduce body weight. So, um, Really, it is very important that the birds are able to maximize all the time that they can to feed, to build fat reserves for migration or to survive harsh conditions. When birds are flushed, they're burning precious energy that can be the difference between successful migration, wintering, or even nesting because of carryover effects. And so um, when, we, when we think about this really broadly, um, you know, this, this issue of recreational disturbance uh, has some pretty significant impacts to just reduce habitat availability, even in situations where things could look overall really, really good. But uh, public beaches are really important. So even though there is some issues with recreational disturbance, they also provide a really important opportunity for education and outreach. And so um, now we're gonna just talk a little bit quickly about some of these different approaches that we can take to think about how to solve this problem. Um, First of all, there's, uh, there's been significant effort here at Manomet and at different wizard sites, very broadly across the whole flyway to address this issue widely. This is an issue that happens on every single shoreline and every single beach across the whole entire hemisphere. And I mean, honestly, probably much of the world. Um, and so, uh, so there have been some large scale projects supported by National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, in partnership with National Audubon, Virginia Tech Shorebird, through the Dyer Human Dimensions Lab. Um, and that's focused on looking at uh, disturbance very broadly across the Atlantic Flyway and has resulted in recommendations and standardizing uh, monitoring at all these different sites 
uh, to, to really get a better understanding of, of how shorebirds and people use the beaches. And so the four public beaches that I've highlighted today are actually part of this project um, and are serving as sort of case studies to really take a deeper dive in understanding um, how we can make some real good uh, efforts moving forward to make sure that beaches and shorebirds and other wildlife are able to thrive into the future. Um, there's a lot of great tools at our disposal. Using steward programs and monitoring programs, you can engage the public to have really friendly, positive interactions and help educate people about what's going on on these important beaches. Um, I think, uh, you know, if, if anyone on this uh, Zoom call has ever been to St. Simon's Island during the nesting season, I would be willing to bet that you have chatted with Lydia Thompson down there on the left about terns or plovers um, with her showing you exactly who is out there nesting on the beach. And really that's one of the most effective things that we can do to help engage people, build goodwill and excitement about shorebirds and other wildlife. And I think Catherine can definitely attest to this too with um, turtle walks and all sorts of different ways to get people engaged. Another great way is having uh, volunteers gather data, whether it's through monitoring programs um, or doing nest inventories like Catherine showed. Um, we have visual aids that we get out to stewards so that they can help show people really what's going on on the beaches. Um, so, so just infographics that really help people understand what they're looking at when they're on the beach, whether it's where they should try to walk, staying on the wet sand so they stay below the tide line, um, avoiding the dry high sand where birds might be nesting, pointing out that shorebird nests are really tough to see. And then you know, having visual aids like this that help show people the why. So this was something that we distributed to partners on Tybee Island to help them understand they have a restriction for dogs on the beaches. And a lot of people didn't understand how dogs could negatively impact wildlife. And so sometimes just having a visual aid that helps explain the reason behind the, the restriction is, is super important. And actually the law enforcement folks on Tybee said that this was very helpful. Um, providing context to helping people better understand that they are sharing the beach with wildlife is really helpful. Um, seasonally relevant uh, signs to help show people what they're looking at when um, so that we can build support with locals and residents and tourists who might not have any idea about the wildlife that's also using the beach that they're visiting. Another thing that we can do to help provide space for wildlife is seasonal restrictions like we had at Golden Inlet with this rope line that's basically symbolic fencing just to help remind people um, to, to give the birds space. And another huge shout out to all the volunteers that were out. Even though we couldn't do stewarding because of COVID, they were out checking the rope line and the posts and reporting um, and keeping that intact and looking good all summer long. And it was really effective. Another great uh, option is creating zones. And so um, this is an example that comes out of the Bay of Fundy, as you can see tucked up there in the northern part of northeastern Canada in the Maritimes. And they actually have restrictions uh, where the beach is zoned, certain sections of beach, uh, to be space for roosting semi-palmated sandpipers. They get thousands and thousands, huge flocks of semi-palmated sandpipers for a window of time in fall migration. And so they've actually set up a huge educational campaign to build community support to protect these areas so the birds can roost uh, during high tide and then they'll disperse after high tide and go feed. So this is a great example of, you know, something that could work really well in certain places on the Georgia coast. You know, you could have um, certain areas that you know are important for, for birds and those might be uh, designated as places where we would see if people would be interested in walking below the tide line so as to not disturb the birds. Um, and, and one of the ways that we can really help with that messaging is through this technique called community-based social marketing. It's really uh, a nice way to say, these are certain things that we would like to encourage in a community. What can we do to help make sure that it's promoted and really sort of shift the baseline? So for example, we might say we'd like dogs to be leashed in areas that are important for wildlife. We'd identify what stops people from doing that and then come up with a variety of different approaches to help build these strategies so that people are excited about it. So we could have asking people for a commitment to sign a pledge or building social norms and having things like dog ambassadors who are always leashed, like my um, dog here, Baxley, who's a perfect role model. <laughs> we could have uh, 
different techniques like using social media and having prompts like those signs and those rope lines. And so broadly, the idea here is understanding that we really have some incredible resources in Georgia. We have these wildlife beaches that we want to be able to celebrate. Um, we want to be able to let people know across the whole coast, each little beach may have a section of it that is really critical for wildlife. Um, and, and just to acknowledge that some areas are important for shorebirds and other wildlife. So we already know what sections of beach are good already. You could ask any birder who's visiting, let's say Jekyll Island, and they'll say that they're going to go to the south end because that's where all the birds go. And so with, a, with an idea of, of highlighting these wildlife beaches, we can uh, really consistently help people see across the whole coast that we've got this rare special habitat that we need to protect um, and, and really build local pride. I mean, I think if you live near Fort Pulaski and you know that you had a bird that came all the way from the Arctic or a bird that came up from Argentina, you would be thrilled and you would want to protect it. So I think, um, you know, we'll end with just, again, the quick idea. I think shorebirds, sea turtles, all of these wildlife species that we love are so important and they can really help bring people together. I, when I was um, talking with Patricia last night about the red knot that she banded in, in South America, it was just so incredible to just feel how small the world, world really was. Um, and, and the idea that the beaches, even the public beaches that we can go to at any time and we might take for granted are just critical for these species that are traveling literally across the whole hemisphere, sort of knitting our whole world together. And I think with that understanding comes greater pride um, for our coasts and helping to unite communities uh, towards, towards a goal of conservation of habitat and these rare special places that we all love. And so with that, um, I hope we have a couple minutes for questions um, and um, maybe uh, if anyone has any questions, I haven't even seen them, but I'm very excited to try to answer some. Excellent. Thank you very much, Abby and Catherine. We have had a couple of questions come in and um, for everyone else, if you have anything that you'd like to ask, please uh, type it into your Q&A box right now. And uh, if there's anything that we don't get to, please uh, feel free to respond to us and we'll try to answer after the webinar. So the first question I think could be for either one of you, um, how does agricultural runoff affect the coast? Yeah, I think broadly, you know, any kind of um, water pollution impacts all of the resources that happen on the coast. I think when you take a big step back and look at any coastal area, you realize pretty quickly it's all connected through watersheds. And so um, it's it provides a good opportunity to help people uh, <laughs> maybe be invested in, in how their local community is affecting issues on the coast. Excellent. Um, so, Catherine, we have a sea turtle specific question. So, do sea turtles not lay eggs until they are 35 years old? And then after the first hatch, how often do they come back to lay eggs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, they don't, they actually don't reach reproductive maturity until they're um, early to mid 30s. And so, uh, to make it to that point is, is obviously quite an achievement. So, most really don't. Um, may get to that point where they're able to come back. But once they start nesting, they'll come back generally every two to three years. Um, we sort of see this cyclical pat pattern where they're coming back generally to the same chain of beaches where they were born. Um, and they'll nest, as far as we know, throughout most of their lifetime. Because of that genetics project, we've been able to see um, at least one or two pairs of grandmother, mother, daughter um, nesters that are all nesting in the same time frame, um, which if you do the math, would put the grandmother at um, in her 90s or over 100, which is pretty amazing um, to think about them still, still being reproductively mature. Excellent. Uh, so Abby, um, Chip would like to know if our Manomet database is, way, is managed in a way that permits it to be available to researchers, stewards, and other birders. Yes, that's a great question. Um, so Manomet uh, runs the International Shorebird Survey um, and uh, both Brad Wynn and, and Lisa Shibley and Arne House also uh, kind of head up that program for Manomet and um, Lisa actually has designed a really incredible 
awesome interactive tool that you can look at all of the International Shorebird Survey data uh, from your computer. And so if you were to uh, search uh, for um, Manomet's International Shorebird Survey information, or maybe we can get it posted, you can actually go in there and you can look at international is going all the way back to 1974. You can see all of the different sites that are covered. Um, there's data from partners in Canada and South and Latin America all being put into this huge database and it's called the International Shorebird Survey Mapping Tool. And it is really wonderful. It's being used by managers on the ground asking questions. It's being used by volunteers to figure out where they want to go count shorebirds. And it's even just being used by folks that want to see what cool shorebird is seen in their area on International Shorebird Survey. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Lisa did share the uh, link over in the chat box. So if anybody would like to check the ISS map, you can do that there. Um, Catherine, I have a question, another question about sea turtles from Tony. Do larger sea turtles lay larger eggs? Um, so you would have a larger one if you, you know, if you look at a different species like a leatherback, sure. Um, they can be quite large. Um, uh, but the loggerhead on average is going to be um, ping pong ball size. And there's not a Sometimes you'll get some smaller ones or slightly larger ones, but they're, they're generally about the same within the same species. Excellent. And um, another follow-up question on turtles. Uh, what is the lifespan of a logger, loggerhead sea turtle? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really hard to say. Um, again, they're not reaching reproductive maturity for several decades. Um, and to get to that point, um, you know, estimates really vary, but people say between one in a thousand to one in four thousand. So most of them really aren't making it past um, their their very earliest years because they're getting gobbled up or they're having some interactions. Um, but if they can reach it to mature, reach maturity, um, you know, their lifespan could mirror that of a, a, a person, so humans, and they could certainly live to be over a hundred years old. Excellent. And we have three more questions in the Q and A, so we'll try to. Um, push through those and then cut off uh, the webinar right after that. Uh, so I have a question from Laura. Are areas of beaches that are important nesting habitat for shorebirds temporarily fenced off or closed to the public to protect them? They are temporarily closed off, yes. Um, and so generally what happens is after the nesting birds have fledged all of their chicks, those ropes and those signs will be removed. If we're telling people there's nesting birds in an area, we want to make sure that there's actually nesting birds in the area. But um, I think there are some real opportunities moving forward to try to uh, encourage, um, you know, at least some signs and some different techniques to help people understand that areas of the beach are also important to shorebirds throughout migration and through winter as well. So some areas that are really important for roosting uh, could probably stand to have some signage as well. Um, and we're hoping to work on some, some strategies to address that in the future. Great, and uh, I just launched a few questions. If everybody who's still on the webinar has a minute to answer some of our polling questions about uh, kind of your experience here on the webinar. So I think this question is for either one of you. Um, do you know if the area of the Georgia Bight with a higher concentration of inlets sees more issues of pollution? A really good question. I don't know. Do you know off the top of your I haven't actually seen any true water quality data, but I know that it's out there and it could be looked at. I think to my I mean certainly some of the areas with where, where there's the large bodies of water, like the Savannah River and, and down here around Brunswick, those are major ports and so that is certainly an issue. But um, do you have any thoughts on that, Catherine? You know, I, I wouldn't be able to say definitively, no. I mean, I think it, um, you certainly can look at all the productivity in this area, um, but in terms of, of pollution, I'm not sure. Uh, I wouldn't want to say definitively on that. That's a great question, though. Yeah. All right, and our final question is from David. Do either of you know what local authorities are doing to make sure the cargo ship in the St. Simons Island Sound will minimize impacts on sensitive coastal ecosystems? Yeah, well, that's been such a process, hasn't it? <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's um, the, the gift that keeps on giving. It, it hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> um, there, um, they recently did a public um, hearing. Um, the Altamaha Riverkeeper has been a great organization really tracking um, 
the, the ship and the recovery efforts on that. Um, and uh, so they're a really good resource. They, they do have a plan. Um, you know, there's some, some concerns, I think valid concerns that have been raised. Um, and hopefully there'll be a lot more um, transparency as the process moves forward. Right now it's all on hold until October because um, they wanted to get out of the height of sea turtle season, or excuse me, not sea turtle season, hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> Always turtles. <I'm> <laughs> And so, you know, right now the process is that they're going to literally be cutting it up in, in chunks and lifting everything with all of the, the small debris, you know, those cars kind of sifting out at the same point. Um, and, um, but in terms of the, the safeguards and the, the processes, um, you know, there's, um, there hasn't been a ton of information. There has been some a town hall that I think was recorded that you can watch, but um, I would point people towards the Altamaha Riverkeeper as well. Um, they've done a great job of, of asking a lot of those questions. And doing a lot of monitoring as well, water quality monitoring and things like that out on the water. So yeah, that's a great resource. Excellent. Well, thank you, Abby and Catherine, for sharing your insight and knowledge with us today. Um, I thought it was fantastic and super interesting. And thank you everyone else for being part of this special presentation and attending today. I know many of you are longtime members of supporters of Manomet. Thank you. I want you to know just how grateful we are for your generosity and commitment. We hope to see you again on a future, or a future webinar. Manomet will be hosting several webinars in the coming weeks, including a virtual bird banding demo on September 15th. For more details, please visit manomet.org. Thank you again for attending today and we hope to see you very soon. <laughs>